Hello and happy Thursday morning. Uh, we're running a little late. I apologize for that. I can come here to join uh, directly from another medical appointment. So uh, the lines were a little bit longer than expected. But what we're planning to do today is on this live online session to simply go through some of the key points of the chapter that we have for this week. And uh, here we have the student view of the uh, learning modules. And if we go all the way to this week's chapter, you will see that uh, the format follows very closely to what you are used to. So I have full lecture videos available for you with the more detailed discussion about this subject matter available. And I'm asking you to complete three pieces of assignment this week. So the digestive quiz, which is really a learning opportunity rather than testing what you know. So don't consider it as a thing that you have to have the correct answers when you're taking the quiz. Uh, with the quiz, as you're taking it, you can click on the uh, there on a button that takes you to the textbook. And as you're working through the quiz, you end up reading the learning material. So it's very much of a learning activity rather than a testing activity. In addition, I'm asking you to complete the digestive anatomy practice. So again, identifying structures, there's a nice lecture video to go with that. Uh, you'll find here in your learning module. So you can first kind of practice the key structures, watch them from the video, and then apply that by completing that digestive anatomy practical. Uh, remember that the practical test questions are directly from these, uh, uh, these practice practicals. So it's definitely worth of putting the time and effort there so you can then totally ace those. And final piece of assignment that I'm asking you to complete this week is the lab activity, which looks at four different case studies, all to do with the digestive system and kind of a clinical perspective on what can happen with the digestive system. They're actually really, really nice uh, case studies. They're not too tricky. There's no curveballs, but it really allows you to apply what you have learned. Feel free to use any resources that you have to tackle the questions for each case study. And uh, we completed that together in a classroom. But if you missed that, uh, I am certain that you will do a great job even independent. Having said all that, what I'm going to do next, I'm just going to jump out from uh, this view and I'm going to share another screen and the screen that you should be seeing is a PowerPoint presentation and we'll use that to guide us uh, when we review the digestive system and we're going to review the digestive system just briefly. So we're not going to go to the great amount of detail. You'll find all the details in those full lecture videos, but I do always want to give these uh, live online sessions uh, whether I have participants, uh, which is great, and then the nature of these sessions is more of a question and answer based, or if I don't have participants, I still want to provide a summary of the uh, content in case someone wants to go later on and watch a recording of one of these sessions. So this is a really overall view of the digestive system, but hopefully helps you to catch the important things from there. So the first thing that I want to start is uh, by going through some of the key terms that it's that are going to be really important that you are familiar with. And once we've had a look of those key terms, I also want to review the material as it moves along the digestive tract. Uh, the correct terminology that we use at each step of that process to describe it. 
So we're going to start with these two terms, digestion and absorption. So remember that digestion and absorption are very different things. What we're seeing when we're talking in a medical sense of the digestion is that we're taking these larger molecules and breaking them apart into smaller molecules. And whenever we break a large molecule into smaller molecules, we end up releasing some energy. And that releasing the energy is really what we're trying to do with the digestive processes. So of course we need the nutrients, the building blocks for things for your body, but just as much we need the energy from the food that we consume. So we've seen this concept of uh, turning large molecules into smaller and in the process releasing energy on our introductory bio classes. I think bio 181 or 156, uh, that might be some of the more common ones when you're preparing for uh, these, these more advanced 200 level classes. Uh, of course, we see an opposite process of this. Uh, so what we're talking about is catabolism, when we're breaking a large molecule into small molecules and releasing energy as a byproduct. We see an opposite process of this anabolism when we are taking small molecules and building something larger, like a macromolecule out of those. Uh, that's what your body does when we're building tissues. That's what we're doing when we're replacing tissues, when we are growing and so on and so on. All of that takes energy. So uh, just be sure that you know those two terms. Those are important ones to know and that we're focusing on the catabolic reactions in the digestion, releasing energy as we're breaking large macromolecules into smaller molecules. So that's what your digestive tract does. We take a large molecule, we break it apart. But the reason why we're really breaking it apart, other than just releasing the energy, is so that absorption can happen. So if you think of our digestive tract, it really is just a long tube starting from the level of the mouth, opening at the other end. At parts, that tube gets wider. At parts, it gets narrower. At parts, we add secretions. At parts, we take away stuff from uh, the inside that tube. But essentially, it's just a long tube. So if you were really technical about it, even when you eat food and it enters to this tract, it never is inside your body as such. Uh, so what we're wanting to do, we're wanting to make that food into small enough molecules to the di through the digestive processes so that those small molecules can now cross the membranes and actually really physically enter into the body. So absorption refers to this process where these small molecules are now moving away from the digestive tract and moving really purely inside the body. So they become available for to be used as building blocks for the uh, body uh, resources for processes and so on and so on. So digestion, whereas it referred to breaking large molecules into smaller molecules and in the process releasing that energy that we can then use to drive body processes, absorption instead referred to that process when these molecules are small enough that they can cross inside the body. So uh, we're, we're wanting to make sure that we get there. And of course, you remember some of the examples. This was not always straightforward. For example, with large fat molecules, uh, we might have to recruit our lymphatic system to grab those when they are too large to enter the capillaries of cardiovascular system. So those two terms, I would really like to make sure that you are comfortable. Two other terms that I wanted to discuss very briefly relate to the fact that we've seen this, I've referred to this in the past, that we have various muscular tubes in the body. And uh, these muscular tubes can do a lot of things, but there's two different kinds of processes that can take place on those when it comes to how it deals with the material inside. The first 
term that we're going to discuss refers to when that muscular tube contracts in a synchronized matter that right next to the area that contracted, another muscle band contracts, and yet another, and yet another, and yet another, and so on. So in this process, we're generating this wave-like movement. So the material really moves through this tube from one end to another end. So we're able to transport materials. This is known as peristalsis. So peristaltic processes, we see those, for example, in our digestive tract responsible for moving materials around, but we can see good examples of that in other parts as well. Say, for example, in a urinary system, we saw uh, we were able to transport urine from the kidneys to the bladder, even against the gravity, say you're in space, still the urine travels this journey and to one direction and one direction only because of these peristaltic waves. Uh, so remember peristaltic waves, peristalsis uh, referred to that we're moving the material to one direction. Uh, so it's very, very coordinated process. And uh, alternative option to that would be segmentation. What happens in segmentation with a muscular tube is that there's a contractions, but they're not really as synchronized. They take place at different parts. So we're really generating segments to that tube. Uh, generating those segments might be important because we want to control when the material is able to move to the next place. But in addition to that, we can actually squeeze the material that's kind of uh, in the middle of the muscle band that gets uh, squashed. Uh, so that can do some breaking down, mechanical breaking down of that material. Of course, as a muscle band contracts, it's going to push a little bit of material to both directions from that, it, it, that area, so into immediate areas. And when it relaxes, that material can return. So we're doing a little bit of mixing of materials, but we're not gaining that overall net movement, which we saw with the peristalsis. So that's our segmentation when we're just doing these more of a random ones. The example that I used in a classroom was to talk about two types of people and how they deal with toothpaste tube. So when we are talking about peristalsis, this would be the people who start from one end and carefully squeeze out the toothpaste to the open end. So we're really moving it in a wave-like manner. Uh, that would be a good example of peristalsis. Segmentation instead, I think the example that I picked for that would be to take the toothpaste tube, uh, tube and squeeze it front, bang on from the middle. It does work, but it doesn't on a long term really move the materials uh, to one direction on the tube. It kind of causes the material just to move back and forth and mix it around and all that. So that was segmentation. The third important concept that I do want to spend a little bit of time talking with you before we get to the other material is that even though the food and the material within the digestive tract travels through the system and it has largely the same material there, we're adding things, we're removing things, but it is the same origin, uh, the names that we use, vary depending on in which part of the digestive tract this material now is. So we're going to start with the food. That's obviously the thing that you're eating. That's what you're consuming. But as soon as food enters to the mouth and it gets mechanically broken down through the process of mastication, and it gets mixed with saliva. Remember, saliva contains salivary amylase, breaking, which was involved with breaking down starches. So we're starting to see not only mechanical breaking of the food material, but also chemical processing of that. At that point, we stop calling that material that you're working with as a food, and instead we start talking about bolus. So bolus is a mixture of food and saliva that has been mechanically broken down. 
So again, in a proper terminology, you would not say that you're swallowing food, you're actually swallowing a bolus. A bolus often forms this nice kind of a little moist ball that's easier to swallow down. And we talked about an example of eating dry foods uh, when we were discussing that bolus in a classroom. Well, bolus travels down from the mouth to the stomach through oesophagus, and we see this peristalsis taking place now on the oesophagus. So remember again, if you stand on your head and you drink a glass of water while standing on your head, the water will still travel from your mouth to your stomach, even against the gravity, because of these peristaltic waves of the oesophagus. Well, once the bolus reaches the stomach, it gets mixed with stomach acids and other secretions of the stomach. And now the content of what used to be bolus becomes much more watery, much more liquidy, if you wish, uh, just describing the structure of that, not, not so much of the content. Uh, so we stop talking about bolus and now we use the term chyme to describe this mixture of stomach secretions and what used to be food. Uh, if you've ever had diarrhea, you will know roughly what a chyme would look like. It's very uh, liquidy. If you ever vomited, you would know roughly what a chyme would look like. It's very liquidy. So that's the material that, that is now at the stomach. Um, the material leaves the stomach and goes to the small intestines, and there's significant changes that take place at the small intestines, and we'll have a look of those uh, in just a little bit. But once material reaches the large intestines, now we have an important need to recover that water from the chyme, because if we ended up just discarding chyme as it is, we would become awfully dehydrated very, very, very fast. So remember, diarrhea is one of the major killers because people get so dehydrated as a result of that process. So really what we're seeing is that large intestines main role is to remove that water from the contents that's now the chyme that has entered from the small intestines to large intestines. And remember also, we discussed in our last chapter that wherever water goes, electrolytes follow, or wherever electrolytes go, water follows. So we're also reabsorbing, in addition to water, a lot of electrolytes. So the leftover material that's this non digestible. Uh, material that we really cannot get nutrients or energy out of. It's the leftover material. It becomes fairly dry. And now we start talking about feces. So feces are what we are eliminating. So I hope that that makes sense. I hope that that all adds up in the language and terminology that we're going to be using when we talk about digestive system. Another slide that I wanted to show you, and I know that this is a kind of a rough drawing, uh, but when I revise the digestive system with students, uh, it's a good way to show really this tube-like appearance of the digestive tract. So it really is just a tube uh, that runs from mouth to the other end. Uh, we saw that there were four general layers that we saw at all parts of this tube, even though the tube might look very different. It might be different in diameter. It might be different in its functions. But in general, we keep seeing those four same layers at all parts of the digestive tract. So we started by talking about where does the digestion starts, and I propose to you that even just the thought, smell, sight of the food might be enough to get us salivating. So the saliva was already one of the digestive processes, so you could argue that digestion starts even before the food enters to the mouth. We talked about uh, Pavlov's dogs as it relates to the psychology in the class and all that good stuff. Other thing that we saw with the mouth was that we had our 
primary teeth and then permanent teeth, the secondary teeth. Um, and we discussed a little bit of the structure of the tooth as well. We discussed how we are getting uh, the salivary amylase with the saliva added to the food and it becomes a bolus. And in that content, we talked about our uh, major salivary glands. And there were three ones that we focused on. We focused on the parotid salivary gland. So parotid salivary gland uh, produced a secretion that was released to the oral cavity next to the second upper molar on each side. A parotid salivary gland secretion was very watery, kind of a liquidy. Um, we talked about how parotid salivary gland is located here next to the ear, kind of like you think of pirates, how they have the parrot sitting next there. We also talked how the facial nerve ran through it. So that makes it a little bit a uh, tricky area to operate if you end up having to deal with that. We also talked about submandibular salivary gland. Submandibular salivary gland is located kind of in the middle of the mandible, a little bit uh, below it and had a duct that opened next to the lingual frenulums, so that a connective tissue band underneath the tongue. Right next to it, we had two small openings for the ducts of the submandibular salivary gland. The mixture from submandibular salivary gland is a mixture of kind of a liquidy and mucus secretion. So it's something in between of these two that we saw or will see. And final salivary gland that we discussed was sublingual salivary gland. From sublingual salivary gland, we're going to see multiple ducts opening underneath the tongue, around the tongue. Secretion from here is going to be very mucus, so sticky uh, secretion. So those were the three salivary glands that we needed to know. Of course, we also saw that the roof of the mouth, we've talked about the floor of the nasal cavity, so we're seeing the same structure palate, and we had hard palate at the front, anterior portion, soft palate at the posterior portion, and uvula hanging at the back. And uvula played an important role in the process of swallowing, also known as deglutition. And we discussed how swallowing is a combination of voluntary and involuntary processes, so you can initiate is wallowing voluntarily, but once it has started, you can't stop it. Uh, then we had a look of the pharynx, so oropharynx and laryngopharynx are going to be relevant to us in terms of the digestive tract. And we saw the oesophagus. And like I said, a very little happened in oesophagus other than transportation for our purposes of what we're discussing. Uh, that's That's not a very exciting structure, but it did this peristaltic uh, wave transporting the material uh, along it from the oral cavity to the stomach. Uh, with the stomach, we saw that there were distinct portions, so cardia immediately in where the uh, oesophagus joined to the stomach. We had fundus, the part that's a little bit more superior even from the part where the uh, oesophagus joined the stomach. This is where the gases tended to build up. We had body, the major bulk of the stomach, and finally the pylorus, so pyloric antrum and pyloric canal, uh, closer to the end of the stomach that end, opens to the small intestines. In addition to that, we saw that we had lower oesophageal sphincter. And what lower oesophageal sphincter does, it's not really an anatomical sphincter, but it is a physiological sphincter. And it ensures that the oesophagus and the lower part of that remains closed so that the stomach acids can climb up there. If you get heartburn, acid reflux, what we're seeing is that stomach acids are now getting to the oesophagus and that's a very uncomfortable feeling. Uh, repeated acid reflux can actually end up to the development of the uh, damage to the lining of the oesophagus as well. Uh, if that continues even further, that, that's a permanent continuous issue that can increase uh, those oesophageal ulcers, if they get exposed to a lot of stomach acid, that can increase the risk of oesophageal cancer.
So how we treat that is usually by neutralizing the stomach's contents so they're not as acidic and don't irritate uh, this uh, acephalus. Uh, two other terms, we had a greater curvature, the uh, kind of lateral side of the stomach and lesser curvature, kind of more medial side of the stomach. Uh, we also had pyloric sphincter that controlled the movement of material from the stomach to the small intestines. Uh, again, if you have ever been in a situation where you have food poisoning, we try to empty the stomach, so it's either going to come up or come through the other end. One interesting characteristic that we saw with the stomach was that even though we talked about the inner circular and outer longitudinal muscle fibers that we saw in all parts of the stomach as one of those four layers. We're going to see a third type of muscle, a set of muscle fibers in the stomach. These are our oblique muscle fibers. Remember, oblique referred to a direction that doesn't align with any of the other planes that we've seen uh, in the study of the body so far. So not aligning with our X, Y, and Z coordinates, if you think of mathematically. Well, we get to the small intestines, but before we get there, let's just remind ourselves that very little absorption happens in the stomach because uh, the stomach contents are so acidic that a lot of the enzymes, a lot of the processes, even though they're mixed there with the secretions, they're not really working optimally. So only once we get to the small intestines, and the first part of the small intestines was our duodenum, kind of leaving the stomach, arching around, kind of hugging the pancreas on that. Uh, pancreas ended up secreting pancreatic juice that was added to this uh, first part of the small intestines through a hepatopancreatic opening. And this pancreatic juice neutralized a lot of that acidity of the contents that have been now released here. And as it neutralized these contents, uh, all of the sudden now a lot of these uh, enzymes and other materials in this mixture could start working optimally. So we end up finding that uh, small intestines is the main site of absorption in the digestive tract. Uh, the following parts of the small intestines are known as jejunum and ileum. Where does jejunum end? Where does ileum start? That's kind of a little bit of a vague question, uh, but to remember our mnemonic DJ eel to remind us of the three parts of the small intestines, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Um, remember, there's a rich blood supply on the abdominal area. Now that we are absorbing a lot of materials and energy in the small intestines, we grab those with that rich blood supply to the abdominal area and transport that water, to, uh, uh, transport those uh, nutrients and energy to the liver where they get stored uh, for the need. So body doesn't go greed and greedy and just tissues burn off the excess energy. Uh, after the small intestines, we get to the large intestines, and the transition point is named after the two parts that are going to be important there. It's going to be called ileocecal opening. So where ileum ends of the small intestines and cecum, the first part of the large intestines, starts. Remember also from the cecum, we saw appendix hanging out. And we've discussed about appendix before. We've discussed how it can get inflamed. You can get your appendix removed and live perfectly fine. We also speculated that the best theory we know at the moment could be that this is where uh, bacteria that played an important role in uh, processing plant, more plant-based uh, food, that's where they were housed. So that could be an explanation why it keeps shrinking as our diet is less and less plant-heavy. Uh, after cecum, we get to the column. So we had ascending column running on the right-hand side, transverse column from right to left, and descending column on the left-hand side. And finally, sigmoid column, it kind of looks a little bit like S-shaped structure if you have good imagination like I do. So what we saw is the column kind of formed this frame around the large intest or around the small intestines. Another thing to notice about 
the colon is that the main function of the colon is to reabsorb a lot of water and electrolytes uh, from what used to be chyme and now becomes feces. So we don't want to be wasting all that water and uh, pooping it out. We want to recover it. And that's what the large intestines does. So it's the main site of water reabsorption. So that was a really the tube part of the digestive tract. We need to add uh, three important glands that play important, or three important accessory structures that play important part. Let's start with the largest of these, which is going to be our liver. And liver had many, many functions. We've discussed some of those earlier on this course. Uh, I think a list that I once made, I got to 100 and gave up at that point. So anything from detoxification, storing energy, red blood cell processing, and so on and so on. But for our purposes, when we're talking about digestive system, one of the main things that the liver does is that it produces bile. So bile is ideal for breaking down fats uh, from the diet. So liver produces the bile and bile travels then to the gallbladder where it gets stored and concentrated. And then when you eat a meal that has a lot of fats, uh, bile gets released from the gallbladder to the first part of the small intestines. So to a duodenum, to through this hepatopancreatic opening, a hepatopancreatic ampulla, and it starts working on those fat molecules from the diet. So again, someone who has had their gallbladder removed uh, probably is not going to be a big fan of eating a big, heavy, fatty meal uh, that's a large meal So because they're not going to be able to process those uh, fat molecules. The final structure that I wanted to talk about is our pancreas. And we've talked about endocrine role of pancreas in blood sugar regulation. This time when we talk about the digestive system, our interest is going to be on the exocrine function of the, goal, uh, of the pancreas. And what pancreas does, it produces pancreatic juice that gets released here to the duodenum through the same duct. So uh, we share that for these two purposes. And this secretion is really the most complete digestive juice or digestive secretion that we produce uh, in the digestive tract. Uh, first of all, it neutralizes that pH of very acidic content so that most of the materials that we've added to this now uh, can start working optimally and the absorption happens in the small intestines. So I think that that's a really good quick walkthrough through some of the key characteristics of the digestive tract. And I hope that you found it helpful. And I think that that's where we're gonna uh, come to the end uh, with what I was hoping to share with you today on this brief review session. So having said all that, let me just try to jump out of here. Uh, what's left to do is to remind you that remember your exam three and practical three grades are up. I take great care in giving you individual feedback on a question level. So if you get a chance, have a look of that. You'll see exactly how you got the points that you got and how they feed into the uh, final grade that you received. And as always, even if you miss a class, it doesn't mean that I wouldn't be here to assist you. I'm here for every step of the way. So don't hesitate to reach out. We can meet virtually. Uh, we can deal a lot of things also in writing. The Canvas messaging system is definitely the best way to get hold of me. Um, and I think that that kind of brings us to the closure of this session. I know that it was a little bit faster. It's important for me that we value your time and your time is well used when you join us. I will offer another session, another one of these uh, live online sessions for the digestive system later tonight. So again, you're more than welcome to join me. If you don't join, uh, recording will still be made available on Canvas uh, of these. Uh, 
Uh, I hope you have a very good rest of the week. Remember, we're seeing the finish line on this course. So it's very, very exciting. It's a good time to keep that momentum going and finish with a strong grade that you deserve for this class. And I look forward to seeing you all in the class next week if I don't hear from you in other contexts. Until then, have a good rest of the day. Have a good rest of the week. And remember to take care of yourself and your loved ones. Until then, bye. <laughs>